Wilhelm Oderberg Learns of a Death I was sitting over a melange at the Café Central reading the Neue Freie Presse when Schroeder suddenly said, I thought of you the other day. There was a pause while he dusted his lapels absent-mindedly, as if he didn't intend to continue the conversation. This was his trick to get my curiosity going, but I knew him, so I waited, and at last he gave in. Yes, I was having lunch with Friedrich from the medical faculty. Guessing some tedious gossip was forthcoming, I went back to my paper, and he... Realising he was losing my attention, said, We spoke of your interest in vampires. A word triggers a memory, a picture of rain-washed blood on stone steps. Seeing he had me, he smiled. I snorted. I'm still the butt of the department's jokes, I see. Well, the paper you wrote on vampire hysteria raised a few eyebrows. Rather a diversion for a philosopher. We all wondered what had prompted your sudden interest. Various things happened. I frowned. Had he forgotten? He continued. Uh, the faculty received a letter from an old student, now a doctor, in London. He has a patient who believes his wife was killed by a vampire. I did not want him to see how his words gripped me. Yes, Dr. Roth believes that the man is insane, of course. He treated the wife before she died, but could do nothing to save her. I put down my paper, steadying my voice, I said. I, I would be interested in knowing more. I'm planning a follow-up article. I ignored his sarcasm. I had to follow any clue. If I could be certain she was truly dead, then I could rest. Schroeder leaned forward and stirred the remains of his coffee. Tell me, Wilhelm, do you really believe in vampires? I paused and said, I'm not sure what I believe. Since Liesel died, I have had ideas that do not sit with the normal worldview of an educated man in one of the most advanced cities in the world. If I said that I did believe... Then I would be referred to Freud, or one of his protégés, and they would reduce it all to a psychosis caused by buried incestuous desire. It wasn't that. I sat, looking out of the window. With my eyes I saw a busy Vienna street, but in my mind I saw my daughter murdered on the steps outside the Kirche am Steinhof, above the mental hospital I'd consigned her to. Since then, the real and the unreal had got mixed up, and I could no longer separate them. Like the thing I'd seen there. The thing I never spoke of to anyone for fear. It would return. Schroeder was watching me. No doubt he thought me as odd as all my other colleagues did, Finally, I said, do you have Dr. Roth's address in London? I invariably went home straight from work. Many of my colleagues lingered at the cafes near the university, but I always wanted to see Rosa. We were childhood sweethearts, and I loved her the first time I saw her, though it took me five years to ask her out. For her part, even after all these years, she still seemed pleased to see me. We'd moved to the new house in the Esslinggasse with its electric lighting from our old place in the Zeltgasse two years previously. That house was much too big after Liesel died, but I still missed the gas lamps and the mirrors. The new place was functional and only a short tram ride from the university round the Schottenring. Our old dog was sitting close to the fire warming himself. He'd been with us many years. He was a dog of no particular breed, but I was fond of him. We called him Votan, which was a joke, because he was small. After dinner, Rosa said, By the way, that letter you were expecting from London arrived this morning. It was strange that the subject of London had been raised twice in one day. I have come to believe in portents, and I do not rule out the possibility 
that the universe in some sense is talking to me, trying to point out roots of inquiry. Rosa put down her book and went over to the writing desk next to the telephone. She looked tired, much older than her fifty years. I I'm sorry, I forgot. You know how absent-minded I'm becoming, and I had such a headache this morning. I took the letter and at the same time took her hand, which was thin and cold. I remembered how fresh and white it had been when she was a girl. I'd kissed it often then, and so much less in the past few years, not through a lack of love, but because time erodes small gestures of affection. I stroked her pale cheek. You must look after yourself, Rosa, or who else is going to care for me when I'm old? I was joking, but she said, You'll have to look after yourself when I'm gone, Wilhelm. What do you mean when you're gone? She pinched my cheek and said, Nothing, you old fool. Then she sat down in her chair, still smiling, and picking up her book, Highness Travel Pictures. Rosa was romantic, and romantics find the blindness of fate very hard to take, and Liesel's death had seemed so very meaningless. I turned away and opened the letter, the paper crisp to the fingers as I tore it. It was from Professor Edmund White in London, a friend of mine from before the war, and it informed me that the Ottoman dagger I'd tracked down with so much effort was to be auctioned in London later that month. The dagger had been in the possession of a wealthy Austrian family who'd fallen on hard times after the war and had been forced to sell their heirlooms. I'd first learned of it some months ago, while reading a document listing the spoil from noble Turkish prisoners of war after our soldiers captured the land from them in Bosnia in the 1700s. I'd instructed Edmund White to purchase the dagger without too much fuss, and authorised him to spend much more than it was worth in order to be certain of securing it. I also told him that I was interested in learning of anyone else that wanted it, especially if they were prepared to pay over the odds. No doubt he thought that all of this perhaps was just more of my madness, but I knew they would be looking for it too, and buying the dagger was my way of flushing them out. They'd vanished since Liesel's death, and if I was to find her, I had to find them first. Then, what with Schroeder had told me still very much on my mind, I said, Rosa, would you like to make a trip to London? She looked up from her reading, mildly irritated at being disturbed again. Why would I? I may have a little business there, one or two things that I could usefully do. It would be nice to see Edmund White again. She lowered her book. Edmund is very nice, and so is Lily, but no, no, I couldn't put up with the damp, the rain, and most of all, the terrible food. They boil everything until it has no flavour at all. I lost weight last time I visited England. She wasn't much of a traveller, and I knew she was unlikely to change her mind once it was made up. I shrugged. I would have to go alone. They didn't know who I was, or, if they did, they had forgotten. They certainly didn't know I was looking for them, reading the newspapers from all over Europe, trying to uncover their trail, following up leads that had all led to nothing, until I came across the dagger. Up until now, it had been kept in the cabinet of an obscure nobleman. No one knew anything about it. But now... It was on the open market, and I knew they would be unable to resist getting it and destroying it. They would try to do so subtly so that no one would realise their involvement, using agents and dupes. That was always their way, to use the innocent to do their filthy work and leave no trace. But the letter from Edmund told me that my plan was progressing. I could leave it in his hands for now. And so I returned to reading academic papers. The evening was passed in companionable reading in the drawing room. Then I looked at the clock. It was my routine to walk the dog before bed. I put on my coat and hat and Wotan raised his head. I clipped his lead to his collar and took him out onto the linoleum-floored landing and down the modern stairs. His claws made a comforting clicking noise as we descended. 
Outside it was raining a cold, sleety rain, and I put up my collar and pulled down my hat. We didn't walk for long. Wotan was old and walked a shorter distance every day. The centre of Vienna was depressing. The war and the end of the empire had ruined so many people. The old world had come crashing down around our ears. On every street corner it seemed there were people wrapped in threadbare blankets begging or standing without shoes in lines for soup from the mobile soup kitchens. Above them, showing through new paint were the colours of the Habsburgs, yellow and black, everywhere their faded eagles. I gave what change I had and was thankful for the food in my belly. After about two hundred metres, Wotan sat down on the wet street. I tried to make him budge, but he was tired, and so I carried him home. When I got back, a handwritten note had unexpectedly arrived from Schroeder with the doctor's address. He must have realised he'd annoyed me and done this quickly as a way of saying sorry. I crumpled the note in my hand. This new lead, coming at the same time as the auction for the dagger, meant I had to go to London immediately. I would make arrangements tomorrow.